Hi, Monk members. Rudyard Griffiths here, the uh, host and moderator of the Monk Debates. Thank you for tuning into this members-only event. Uh, here's what we're going to do for the next hour. The purpose of the Monk Dialogues is to really have um, extended conversations about the big issues and ideas transforming our world. And over the last year, over the course of 20 dialogues, we've brought you a range of perspectives from all around the world, different points of views, different uh, insights that we think help uh, elucidate this extraordinary moment that we are all in together. Uh, today's gonna be a bit of an experiment for the Monk Dialogues. Instead of just one interlocutor, one participant, we've got two for you. Uh, the idea here is to allow uh, both of our guides today to have a conversation between each other I'm going to be around uh, with some of your questions, Monk member questions, but again, truly uh, an opportunity for a dialogue, an exchange of ideas, and the luxury of doing this not in five minutes, not in, uh, not in the con constraints and constricts of uh, traditional television, but to spend an hour together uh, to think big thoughts and hopefully to come away from this uh, a little bit uh, wiser. So let me introduce the, the two participants that we have for today's Monk Dialogue. Uh, we're really exceedingly fortunate to have uh, both of their voices uh, with us. Uh, the first is a well-known uh, contributor to the New Yorker magazine. Uh, they is a, a renowned uh, columnist, uh, thinker, uh, previously a journalist and editor in Russia, having experienced uh, personally uh, some of the acute persecution that the regime of Vladimir Putin has subjected different communities and groups to. They is a, uh, a renowned LBGT uh, advocate and uh, human rights activist, the author of 11 books. I've got many of them on my bookshelves. Here they are on our screen. They's latest, Surviving Autocracy. Uh, there are other titles that we all know and love. The Future is History, and The Man Without a Face, The Unlikely Rise of Vladimir Putin. Uh, our second uh, sp speaker interlocutor tonight is uh, equally well known uh, to many of us. He's a lecturer at the Department of History at the University of Jerusalem. He received his PhD from Oxford University. He's the co-founder of Sapienship, a social impact company focusing on education. His books have sold over 27 million copies around the world, translated into over 60 languages. Here's just a snapshot of them, a brief history of mankind, Sapiens, Homo Deus, 21 lessons for the 21st century, and his latest book, which is in Canadian and uh, U.S. bookstores right now, uh, the graphic novel of Sapiens, uh, The Birth of Humankind. Well, as I said, here's, here's what we're going to do. Uh, you know, instead of me uh, thinking up questions that probably are not as uh, interesting and engaging as the ones that you have for each other, having followed each other's work, having thought about some of the same issues and ideas, I, I thought it would be interesting in a sense to turn this program over to the two of you. We've agreed that our focus is going to be the, uh, the kind of twilight struggle of democracy and authoritarianism, uh, the rise of populism and its effects on uh, liberal culture. I think we all agree that those trends, that, that face-off was happening well before the pandemic, and I think this will be a, a really interesting opportunity to hear both your views as to how this pandemic has either accelerated that con conflict, that confrontation, and what possibly could flow from it uh, in the years to come. So uh, Yuval, over to you. Uh, I'm gonna let you open up this conversation uh, with, uh, with Masha. Thank you. So I think that the big question on everybody's mind is really what, what happened or what is happening that after the seeming victory of democracy in the late 20th century, we now see the rise of authoritarian regimes all over the world. Um, and also the other linked question is whether these authoritarian regimes are a new phenomena, a new type of, uh, of regime, or is it a return to something we have seen previously in history? So um, I'm not sure what the answers are, but I would definitely uh, like to hear your views on it. 
Um, hi, you all. First of all, it's such an honor to be sharing a virtual stage with you. Um, so, you know, um, I, think, I think we have to settle on our terms first. Uh, when we talk about the victory of democracy, what do we mean by democracy? And I think this is, um, I assume you're referring to what you in your books actually refer to as the liberal story. Right? Uh, and, um, and I think that's a really important distinction. I mean, um, I think we can think about it in terms of story. I think we can think of it in terms of aspiration, but in kind of everyday political conversation, we tend to talk about it in terms of uh, institutions, right? As though democracy were something that, uh, that was just built and lived in. And I think that's, that's, that's a huge misconception you know, I, th I think that um, sort of in the, in the popular imagination, when we start talking about the, um, the victory or not victory of democracy, I think people imagine that, um, that there are systems that are built and that somehow suddenly start crumbling. Um, and I think it's much more useful to talk about it again, as you do in terms of story or, or as I try to think about it in terms of, um, of an ideal toward which a society is, is reaching. And so I think the question is, you know, uh, has the ideal of the government of the governed lost its luster? And I'm not sure that it has, but I think it has, um, what's happened in a lot of places that I've written about is the connection between sort of the, the existing government and and this and this ideal of um, the government of the government has has felt like it's disappeared, and that it's it's reached a level of hypocrisy that is intolerable, and it's also reached you know sort of the, the level of anxiety in society has reached a level that's in, intolerable. I I think that. <laughs> I completely agree that it makes things a bit easier if we think about it in terms of stories and not institutions. And it seems that one of the things that characterizes the new authoritarian regimes, the new dictatorships, however we call them, is that they, they don't really have a new story or a different story. And this is why, you know, many people in many countries to, around the world ask themselves, are we living in a dictatorship or not? You know, in the 1930s, there was no question. If you lived in Italy of Mussolini or Germany of Hitler or the USSR under Stalin, then you knew for a fact that you're living in a dictatorship. There was no way of hiding it. Nobody tried to hide it. Hitler did not pretend to, uh, to be a Democrat. And today in many countries around the world, even the people who, who, who say, look, we are, there is now a creeping dictatorship taking over, it's, it's hard to be sure and it's hard to convince people because um, the, 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 the alleged dictators deny it they keep many of the forms and institutions that supposedly characterize democracy and they don't come up with an alternative story. No, there is a country which is very proud of having a completely different story about how humans should manage their affair and this is China. It doesn't pretend to be a democracy. But if you look at the usual suspects for being these new strongmen, these new dictators, whether it's Putin in Russia or Erdogan or uh, aspiring uh, like uh, Orban in Hungary or even Netanyahu in Israel, they think, no, we are Democrats. This is a democracy. What do, we, what do you want from us? There are elections, there are parliaments, um, everything is, 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 is working fine. And, you know, at, at least the, the argument in Israel is often that people have, everybody believes in democracy. They have a different story about what democracy is. With one camp, 
basically claiming that democracy is just elections and uh, it's really a majority dictatorship, whatever the majority wants, whatever the majority votes for, it's democratic. And the other camp saying, no, 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 democracy is, is much more than elections. If 51% of the voters um, support taking away voting rights from the other 49%, this is not democratic, even though 51% want it. And if 99% of voters vote for locking up the 1% in some concentration camp and murdering them, this is not democratic, even though 99% want it. And this more complex story of democracy, I think this is what is eroding in, 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 the, last, in the last few years. And we are left with a very kind of poor and shallow understanding of democracy. Um, but still, it leaves open the question, why did it happen? Yeah, I disagree. I, I think that um, I think that you are, you know, you being a member of the of the tribe of historians uh, are, are committing something of a historic historian's fallacy which is um, which is taking what we know now and and assuming that it was known then uh, or that it was true then. Um, in totalitarian in the totalitarian Soviet Union, the one of the biggest things you had to memorize was that you lived in a democracy. Uh, the Soviet Union had elections. The elections were not only you know a national holiday, but all the school children talked about, the importance of the free expression of citizen will. Uh, there was, you know, the, the ruling principle of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was called democratic centralism. Mm -hmm. Democratic centralism was precisely the, um, the tyranny of the majority that you're describing, <clears throat> but it was called democratic. Democratic centralism was this idea that if a majority of the Communist Party held a position, all the other members of the Communist Party had to hew to the same position that that's how the party was run. And because it was a one party regime, uh, you know, that, was, that was a way of enabling the continuation of the one party regime, the continuation of totalitarianism through some sort of democratic rhetoric. I mean, that was, uh, we were told that the Soviet constitution was the most democratic constitution in the world. And in fact, it was, if you read it, it was a great document. None of what was written in it was actually true, right? But, um, but I think it's a mistake to think that if you lived in, in a totalitarian regime of the 20th century, you had no doubt that you lived in a dictatorship. It was actually blasphemy to say that you lived in a dictatorship. It was total blasphemy to say that you lived in a totalitarian state. And we, you know, we're, we're seeing the sort of the, the remnants of that to this day among Russian scholars who resist the concept of totalitarianism as applied to the Soviet Union. So, um, and I think that um, as, as, you know, the, the, uh, in history, because history relies so much on textual evidence, there always seems to be much more of a story in retrospect than there is in the lived experience of, of people who actually you know, were, were in that country at the time. But if you read contemporary accounts of uh, Hitler's Germany, you know, one of the things that, that certainly strike me, you know, if I'm reading Victor Klemper or, um, or Eric Frum from before he left the country, it's actually about the lack of coherence. It's about the overwhelming destructive impulse and the hodgepodge of ideas that are that are sort of swept together to support that destructive impulse. So, in that sense, I you know I think that what we're going through now is perhaps less different than we imagine, right? I think the difference is more between between one things what things feel like when they're in progress and when we and what they seem like when we have collapsed them to. to uh, to a set of historical facts and understandings. Mm 
that doesn't answer the fundamental question of why this happens, right? Why, why there are <clears throat> times in history when a large number of people seem to want to embrace something fundamentally undemocratic, right? Um, and, and I think that we are in agreement that, the, that the, those times sort of recur and that we're living through one of those times. And I find Eric Fromm's uh, explanation actually to be the most compelling, which is he talks about times in history when enough people feel enough anxiety, enough instability, that all they desperately want to do is hand over agency to somebody who will promise them a plan, right? And, to, and who, will, who will promise them that they will be in charge. Right? And, that's, and that's how you get sort of a mass embrace of autocratic rule. But I, I, I agree fundamentally that yes, it's something like what used to be called the spirit of the age, that it's just like a wind sweeping over the, the whole world. And um, as a historian, I, I usually don't believe in strong explanations for why. Many of the most important developments in, in history, I don't think we know why they happened. You know, like why did the scientific revolution begin in Europe and this insignificant peninsula uh, conquered most of the world? I've heard so many theories and read so many books about it. And I think that basically we can describe we can describe the chain of events of how it happened, but we don't have a good explanation for why it happened and why it happened there and then. And you know, also with the current question of what's happening now, I've read quite a number of books on, on, on this issue and articles, and there is an entire industry, certainly in the United States, trying to understand the shift to the right of the Republican Party and the unexpected rise of, of, of President Trump. And, you know, what I don't understand American politics very well, but what I find missing is that, you know, you have these very specific explanations about what was happening with the Midwest and what was happening with the trade agreements and the decline of American industry and, and, so, and, and American racism and so forth and so on. But the minute you expand your horizons, you see that similar things, or at least to, the, to, to my eyes, they seem somewhat similar. We, we can talk about whether it's, it's similar or not. But to me, it seems that similar things are happening in Brazil, are happening in Sri Lanka, are happening in India, are happening in Hungary, in Poland, in the Philippines, under completely different conditions. You know, people who say that, okay, um, the rise of, of, of Trump is because of uh, a globalization hurt the United States, but globalization helped to, some, to, to a large extent, countries like India, like Brazil. So why do, they, do we see the same type of, of phenomena there? And what's, what's the common thread for all these different countries? And then you have some people explaining that this is technology, that it's social media and things like that. And you know, maybe even though uh, also I, I, I tend to think that we exaggerate the novelty of so social media compared to previous systems of propaganda Whatever you can say about fake news and propaganda today, um, Goebbels knew it almost a century ago. It's not really something that new. So um, if, if you can say anything about, about these issues, uh, again, the, the global perspective of it, I, I would be very interested to hear. I love, I love the way you pose the question that you sort of say, okay, there's no why. Um, there's, it's useless to talk about why we can't really understand why things happen, but why, why are they happening? Um, and I, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's sort of temperamentally very close to, to my heart. Um, because I agree that we can't, we can't really pretend to know why, but, but, but we do want to try to, to describe it. 
Um, so again, you know, I would go back to um, to the great thinkers of of of, of the mid. 20th century who tried to explain the rise of totalitarianism. <clears throat> and, and I think there's, there's a lot to be found in both Eric Fromm and, and Hannah Arendt, right? Um, the, and, and especially from who, when he writes about anxiety and the inability to imagine a future. And I think that's perhaps where the common threads of um, of technology and globalization and the demographic shifts in the United States and in many other countries come together, right? They're all stories about a sense of living in a changing, shifting reality that is so different from what you were born into or what your parents could have told you about that, um, that you can't imagine what life will be like in 10 years, 15 years, 30 years. And I think that that inability to imagine the future is, is so destabilizing for people. It is so frightening for a majority um, of people, right? I think, again, Fromm thought that a small number of people would, all, would always feel like it's an opportunity for self-invention and will embrace it, but a large majority find that this free, freedom to invent the future is overwhelming. And I think that we have seen times when sort of humanity imaginatively overcomes this, this impasse of instability, when we, when we have visionary leaders who kind of say, okay, well, this is what the future is gonna look like. The future is going to be glorious. Uh, that doesn't always end well. Uh, sometimes it ends extremely poorly, but you know, um, I think that's how, uh, again, in very broad strokes, that's how you get a country like the United States built on a set of abstract ideals. That's, but that's also, of course, how you get communist dictatorships built on this idea of an entirely different future. Right? Um, and then you have the sort of the more traditional autocrat who is past oriented, who says, okay, you feel uncomfortable, you feel destabilized, you feel displaced or in danger of being displaced. You can't imagine the future. I can promise you that the future is going to look like the past. I can magically tr transport you to an imaginary past and you will feel comfortable again, you will feel stable again. And I think, you know, that's Trump and that's, and that's Putin and that's Orban. Um, I'm not sure if that's Netanyahu. I would really love to hear what you, what you, what you think about that. Um, because I don't have a, a grasp of what sort of the, 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 the appeal is of, of Netanyahu's autocratic politics. Um, and I actually also think that's Hitler. You know, Hitler was a past oriented autocrat. He also promised this, um, this, this magical transit to, to an imaginary future. But there are two things that jump to my mind when, when I hear you say that. I mean, first of all, it's, bad news, terrible news, because um, the pace of change in the world is only accelerating and it will be more and more difficult to imagine the future. I mean, I think that now is the first time in history that really nobody has the slightest idea how the world would look like in 20 years. Basic things like the job market, what kind of jobs people will have in 20 years. You know, in, in, in the first half of the 20th century, of course, there were lots of things changing and lots of things people didn't know about the future, but the job market, it was changing, but much, much, much more slowly than now. If you're a coal miner in 1920, you can expect to have a job as a coal miner in 1940. If you're a farmer in 1920, you can expect to be a farmer in 1940. Things don't change that, that dramatically. Now, nobody really knows how the job market would look like in 2040 or 2050. So if the basic fuel of, of what we are seeing is the fear of an, of an unimaginable future, then uh, th that's really bad news. But in a sense, it's maybe also bad news for the dictators or would-be dictators because they can't really stop these immense changes. 
I mean, they promise the one thing, the one thing that there is a guarantee they cannot provide. They cannot stop. The times they certainly can't go back. So they will have to make greater and greater efforts to convince people that nothing is changing or that we are in the past. And that's, that's very dangerous because the, the way they usually do it is they focus on, 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 on some maybe minor issue, which becomes a symbol and distracts people from everything else. If we look at Israel, so like a, a wonderful candidate for that would be to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, which is something that at least the extreme right in Israel is talking about. Um, you know, if, if everything is changing dramatically, but you rebuild the temple, that could be a grand gesture that could kind of camouflage the fact that uh, we are not living 2000 years ago. You, you will need larger and larger gestures to have this kind of effect, convincing people that nothing is changing or actually that we are on the way to the past. And the other association I had was that, again, uh, I, I'm not so sure about, about the dictators of the early 20th century. I mean, I think you know about, uh, about this era more than me, so, so maybe I'm, I'm wrong. But my impression was that certainly Lenin and to some extent Stalin and, and Hitler, they had huge visions for building a completely new world. Even Hitler, this, even though Nazism is far more past oriented than communism, still Nazism imagined creating a completely new man and creating a new Reich of a thousand years, which will not be just a reproduction of the first or, or, or second Reich. And a lot of the dictators, I, I, I think, of the early 20th century, they had grand visions for a new world. And politics was a battle between these visions for the future. And what strikes me about a lot of the strongmen we now see is their utter lack of imagination. That they actually have the technology to at least imagine and maybe even implement a really uh, uh, futuristic scenarios. Hitler and Lenin, they had steam engines and radio. The Stalins of today, they can rely on genetic engineering to create a new man. They can rely on AI and algorithms, not steam engines. And yet, with a few exceptions, they seem to be very unimaginative. And I'm not even sure if it's good or bad. I mean, maybe it's good that they are not fully aware of the potential of, I mean, they are completely unlike the Hollywood villains that you see in science fiction movies, that you have these kind of futuristic despots that engage in genetic engineering to create superhuman robots and whatever. No, I mean, they, as you say, they talk about, I mean, let's freeze everything or let's go back to the past. And one of my worries is that this, this is just a phase, that the current crop of strongmen and would-be dictators, they, uh, they yes, th th their vision is let's freeze everything and let's try to go back to the past. This will not be possible. So the next generation would have to either adopt these grand gestures of going back to the past, like building the temple of, in Jerusalem, or like what, like what we saw with ISIS, with the Islamic Caliphate, that you have to be really bold in going back to the past to kind of distract people from the fact that this is something completely new. Or you can have the next generation being like these real Hollywood villain types that they fully grasp. They didn't come out of the KGB. They came out of Instagram or the laboratory. They fully grasp 
what can be done with the new technologies. And these will be real dystopias. And we, we are beginning to see some experiments in, in this direction, like certainly in China, for instance, the development of the social credit system. I mean, this is something, or, or, or total surveillance, this is something that Stalin and Hitler could dream about, but didn't have the technology to implement. The idea that you can follow everybody all the time and you can basically monetize every single action and interaction in people's lives, this is potentially the basis for a completely new kind of authoritarian and, and totalitarian regime. So, I mean, th these are my, my associations. Right. Um, so a couple of reactions. Uh, one, um, you know, the, the, and this is piling onto the already a very large pile of bad news that we have accumulated here. Um, but the difference between dictators and democratic leaders, um, one of the differences is that dictators don't have to deliver on their promises, right? Um, in fact, again, going back to Arendt, she wrote, um, I think very brilliantly about that interplay of dangling the promise of stability and, but creating constant instability. And that's what creates the longevity of, of a totalitarian dictatorship. But I think it's also true of other autocrats, right? That um, we've certainly seen you know, Putin do that uh, where he keeps saying the nation is at the, on the verge of catastrophe. I'm the only one who can save it. And he's been saying this for 20 years and it keeps working for 20 years, right? Uh, because, because he has found that sort of the, 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 uh, the perfect balance of inciting fear and promising a, a kind of calm in the future, which of course is, is a past oriented future. So, um, so in that sense, dictators will always have the upper hand over democratic leaders, right? You're saying, um, but wait a second, dictators cannot deliver on their promise to stave off <clears throat> progress, but they don't have to, they just have to keep making the promise. And in fact, the greater the fear, the more efficiently they can make the promise. The other thing that um, listening to you talk about the sort of the real life dystopias that are being created um, makes me think about is, you know, for the last couple of weeks, I've been uh, writing a lot about the protests in Russia. And one of the extraordinary things is the sort of watching the, the use of really advanced technologies combined with just like the shambles in which that country is, that society is, and that state is, right? So a lot of the people who have been arrested in, I mean, most of the people who have been arrested in the last two weeks, and that's at this point, you know, we're talking about like 7,000 arrests total. Um, most of those people were arrested in the streets or in their own apartments by people who you know, physically grab them, drag them off, throw them into a police vehicle, keep them in that vehicle for hours and sometimes days. And it's, very, um, um, it's very down market kind of dictatorship. And, um, and I, you know, I'm not saying this lightly, it's obviously horrifying to watch. But then there's a very significant group of people who are picked out uh, by facial recognition software, right? uh, and especially in Moscow. My, um, somebody I, I interviewed the other day who actually was my daughter's school principal until we left Russia seven years ago, she went to two protests and, um, and was, was captured by surveillance cameras. And then the surveillance camera that is, uh, that is mounted on the front of her apartment building, right? Where she, she, she purchased an apartment and the apartment building probably pays for the surveillance camera, um, but it's, it feeds into the larger network. Match that photo of her coming into her own, build, her own building with photos of her at the protests wearing a mask, right? So very sophisticated software. And then the police come to her house and arrest her. She was laughing at how ridiculous it is because all they had to do was look at her Facebook page and they would have seen her at the protest. They didn't have to 
uh, to mobilize the sophisticated system. But, uh, you know, the sort of, the, we're seeing this very old fashioned dictatorship that also casually starts to deploy really futuristic uh, dystopian technologies. Um, and I think that's not, that's not how we imagine the dystopias of the future, but I think that that's very much what they're, what, what they're actually going to look like. But I'm not so sure that dictators don't have to deliver. It depends how, how strong they are. And, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to get it from a different angle. How do you, how do I know if I'm living in a dictatorship? Like if you can give me a kind of, of, of test that I can ask about my country to see, am I living in a dictatorship or not? What, what would you say? That is such a great question. Um, and I've never thought of it uh, in that particular way, but I have certainly thought about how you perceive the society that you're living in um, and, and how outsiders perceive it. So for example, I think most of my friends in Russia um, realize that they're not living in a democratic country but I have no idea that they're actually living in one of the most repressive regimes in the world today. Like, I think they would think that that's ridiculous. But in fact, they, you know, they are. Like by any measure that we can apply in terms of, uh, you know, whether, whether people can have an impact on the makeup of their government, whether there's any freedom of the media, whether there's any access to the media on the part of people who oppose the regime, whether um, uh, how many political prisoners there are, uh, how, how functional the court system is in general, you know, even outside the political, uh, uh, political crimes, you know, any of those measures, and, the, and here are some criteria that I'm proposing for, for how we, met, we can measure whether we're in a, in a dictatorship or not, by any of those measures, Russia ends up near the very bottom of, of a ranking, right? Uh, it's also the, near the very bottom of, of transparency ranking. So it's one of the most corrupt countries in the world. And yet I think most Russians would probably tell you, yeah, not, you know, things aren't that great. And yeah, the country is pretty corrupt, but they're convinced that dictatorships and, you know, really like, um, really truly corrupt countries are probably elsewhere because what they're living in is normal. Mm. It's not normal in the way we think about countries, how countries should be, but they wake up in this reality every day and they go to work and they see friends and they eat food and, um, and there's public transportation that functions and other infrastructures that, 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 that function. And so, it can't possibly be the nightmare if it just feels like daily life, right? Um, and so I think the answer to your question is you don't actually know unless, this, unless it's something that you do um, either professionally as you know, a political scientist, a historian, a journalist, um, a political activist, right? Not professionally, but that's how you're thinking about your role in the world you probably don't know that you live in a dictatorship when you live in a dictatorship. So it, it really goes back to where we started with the issue of stories, that we have a certain story in our mind of how a dictatorship feels like and looks like, and we look around and it doesn't, it doesn't feel like the stories about Hitler, so it can't be. And you know, maybe this is one of the mistakes of the scholarships on 20th century totalitarian regimes, they made you know, the most extreme example maybe in human history, the kind of standard. And every time you check what's happening around, uh, you see, well, it's not Hitler, it's not Auschwitz, so we're okay. <laughs> and um, you know, another way of putting it is, you know, like, where are the bodies? we are used to dictatorships that have a, a, a death toll of millions, either through you know, mass murder and concentration camps or mass incarcerations and gulags, uh, 
or mass starvation because of all kinds of crazy schemes that the regime tries to implement and it causes millions to starve to death unnecessarily. And this kind of the gold standard of a dictatorship and uh, it, it's not happening right now, at least in most countries. So it, it kind of, you know, I, I, I also think that we as, as historians, we made a big mistake in explaining what fascism and Nazism and totalitarianism is by depicting them as kind of the ultimate evil. And you have the feeling that if you see like fascism in the street, it will look extremely ugly and evil. And when you look at the street, people are nice and friendly and you look in the mirror and you're kind of, you know, I'm, I'm okay, I'm, I'm beautiful. And so it can't be. And it's the same kind of mistake that I think Hollywood movies repeatedly do, that they depict the evil guy like Darth Vader or Voldemort or whoever as extremely cruel even to his followers He's no friends, he's a jerk, and he's ugly as hell. And this, it, it doesn't work like this. I mean, real dictators are charismatic and being part of the collective is, you know, you're not surrounded by jerks, you're surrounded by wonderful, beautiful people. And this is something that Again, all, all these, many of these kind of books and movies about the ultimate evil, they, they, they mislead us. Um, I, I agree with you, but it's, I think it's even worse than that, again, um, which is that, you know, that great question, where are the bodies? Uh, if you had asked a regular German living in Berlin in 1943, Right, when the bodies numbered in the millions, they wouldn't have been able to tell you where the bodies were. Right? And this maybe takes us back to <clears throat> something that we touched on earlier in the conversation, which is how we think about the media. Right? Um, and I think you're absolutely right when you say that social media are not as new as some people make them out to be as sort of an instrument of propaganda but I do think that, um, that, that media in general you know, construct obviously our sense of where we live. And, and by that, I mean, you know, what, com what community we belong to and what, what is news is what happens in that community, but we didn't see, right? And so we need to read about it in the newspaper or see it on television to understand what's going on in our community. And I think that, uh, you know, the Germans didn't know where the bodies were because the bodies weren't in their community. They first expelled the Jews from their community, from their, you know, from, the, from what they imagined to be their community, but also their physical communities. And then they killed them when they were outside the community, right? In that sense, totalitarian Russia was different, right? Um, but, but there, you know, the, the expulsion was much faster. Like somebody would get plucked out of a family, then declared an enemy and then executed. But there was still the ritual that people had to go through by, you know, they had to denounce this person. So it's like the bodies existed outside their community. And, um, you know, and I think also like Israel is masterful at this, right? Um, it's not that there aren't people in Israeli, uh, it's not that there aren't places in Israeli controlled territories that actually would look pretty close, I think, to what we, you know, what even a Hollywood movie about, um, about a ter terrible dictatorship would, would, would show us, right? Um, you know, I think that- uh, With one important exception, that there are very few bodies I mean, again, maybe one of maybe one of issues. You don't see that picture, right? I mean, they're like right? in both both physically and mentally, they don't see the picture. The picture is not, you know, 
physically they don't have access to the occupied territories. Um, and mentally, they think of it as a, as a magical elsewhere, right? It's, uh, I mean, it's right there. It's, you could literally walk there, right? But it is elsewhere. It's not part of the world that Israelis inhabit. And in that sense, I think that, um, that you know, it's, it's, it's actually a fair comparison uh, because it's an incredible trick that excludes you know, uh, the sort of entire sphere of the functioning of Israel from the Israeli, Israeli imagination. No, the, the thing is that maybe part of what is happening is that um, objectively, there are, at least for now, far fewer bodies because authoritarian regimes discovered a better way of controlling people without mass killing and mass murder. And you know, it also goes back to social media that people say, yes, in, in Berlin in 1943, they didn't know what's happening in Auschwitz, but you know, today with uh, Instagram and YouTube and all these drones and everything, no way. If somewhere that the, they have a concentration camp, we'll have the, we'll have the, 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 the pictures in, in two minutes. So if there are no pictures, th there is no concentration camp. And to some extent, I think that that's even right, that objectively there are far fewer bodies in most of these regimes today than in the 20th century versions, partly because um, new ways of controlling people with less bloodshed have been developed. And again, Israel is, is a very, very good example. Israel for many years had to work under a magnifying glass there is extreme sensitivity in much of the world and also within Israel uh, to, to death. Not to, you know, if people wait in a roadblock for two hours on the way to work, nobody cares. If all kinds of, uh, you know, day-to-day -day misery is inflicted, nobody cares. But bodies are counted and they attract a lot of attention. And one of the things that happened over the last uh, years, and it's not all bad, of course, is that Israel has discovered a way to control millions of people with minimal bloodshed. And again, it goes back to technology. Um, with the new, over the last 10 years, there have been a dramatic shift in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Israel has become much, much more strong and its position in the world also improved dramatically, as we've seen in, 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 in only in the last year with the treaties with the UAE and Bahrain and so forth. And this is partly as a result of geopolitical shifts in the world, but it's also partly due to new technologies that enable Israel to control the 2.5 million Palestinians in the West Bank with very few boots on the ground and very little direct bloodshed. There is a lot of misery of other kinds, but relatively few bodies. And I think this is to some extent true of many other of these authoritarian regimes that at least for now, I don't know what will happen in five years, 10 years, but they are far less murderous. And also that um, they don't display uh, violence, they, they, they hide it far more effectively. Again, if you go back even further in history, you look at the French Revolution, and there was a time when new regimes deliberately exaggerated their power, and especially their ability to inflict violence and death, because they needed to convey the message that we can do that. And the, 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 the new type of regimes, they are extremely careful about it and they are quite good at it, of hiding. You know, um, I wonder if, how new this is and I wonder how it is, how much it is actually connected to technology. Because 
I think that totalitarian regimes discovered an economy of terror back in the 60s and 70s. You know, uh, Arendt believed that totalitarianism is possible only in countries that can afford depopulation, that have such large uh, populations that they can just sacrifice a part of the population to terrorize the rest of the population. But then, you know, we saw in the 60s and 70s as the Soviet Union established its reign of terror over Eastern Europe, that that wasn't necessarily so. And this is what Václav Havel was, was trying to figure out, like, what is this regime, right, that doesn't actually imprison millions and, um, and, and kill hundreds of thousands, he called it post-totalitarianism. But I don't think it was post-totalitarianism. I think it was a more efficient totalitarianism. I think it's a totalitarianism that terrorized by example. Right? Uh, and I think that you know, to the extent that it deployed technology, it deployed technology by, because, because so many people would know about that example. Right? You didn't have to show physically that terror could come to every house. You just had to show virtually that terror could come to every house. And for that, you, have, you really only had to pick off a few people in any given imaginary community. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, I think one way to think about it is, oh, would that have worked had there not been memory of the great terror? And one hypothesis is that it wouldn't have worked, that it ran on the fumes of the terror. But I think what we're seeing now is that it actually does work. Um, you don't need to have, you know, depopulation to be able to control, you know, large populations of people. Mm. I, I don't really know. Again, I'm not an expert on, 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 that, on that era, but it's, it, it is a, a fascinating possibility that it's the, the, this ability to create totalitarian with, totalitarianism with, with uh, uh, much less violence, overt violence, has already been developed previously. And, um, but but I, I really wanted to, to use the, the, the remaining minutes to, to ask and, and, and raise another issue, which you haven't touched upon, which I think is close to both of us, which is the issue of gender. And do you think, again, well, uh, the whole conversation kind of tended to go, is, is, is what happening right now the same or different from the 20th century and in what ways? So I'll, I'll just keep with, with, this, with this direction. And do you think the obsession of at least certain of these uh, leaders and regimes today with gender and with the LGBT community in, in particular, is it something new? Or is it, does it just reproduce something we've seen in the 20th century? And if it is new, then what's your thoughts on that? Why did it suddenly become like these are the new enemies of the people? Um, I'll tell you my hypothesis and I'd love to hear yours. Um, <clears throat> I think it's both new and old. It's, um, it's old in the sense that, um, you know, because these are past oriented autocracies, right? And they promise a return to this imaginary past to a time when you were comfortable. They have to focus on the most visible social change and the most rapid social change of the last generation. And that of course has to do with gender and LGBT issues, right? So um, I think that's why we're seeing all over the world this incredible obsession with, with gender and LGBT stuff, you know, from Brazil to Poland to Trump's United States to, I don't know, is, is, is anything, I think Israel might be an exception in this, in this regard. Israel is very different in this respect. Like the guy in charge of the police and of the, a lot of the repression, he's openly gay. <laughs> and they, they are really, I mean, they are really boasting that Israel is, and then it's true that Israel is the most liberal country in the Middle East, certainly in terms of LGBT rights. And uh, it, it's a strange place. And, uh, you know, you, you can never make assumptions about what goes together and what doesn't. Okay, so let's just, let's just like set Israel aside as the exception that proves the rule, uh, which is always a convenient trope. Uh, but, you know, it's certainly, it's certainly true in Russia. And, 
And I think these, these campaigns, these anti-LGBT campaigns or campaigns against so-called gender ideology are, they do have that common trait of, we are going to restore the world as you knew it so you can feel comfortable in it. And I think it's a way of speaking directly to anxiety about a changing world. What, what do you think? Yeah, I basically agree. I mean, it goes again, goes back to the beginning of the conversation that this fear of, of the future and the, the, and, and the difficulty of imagining something different. So really the changes in gender and gender identity are in, in this sense, you know, the, the, they challenge the imagination more than almost any other actual, actual thing that, that happened. But okay, jobs change, but genders change. People can change their, their, their gender and their sexual identity. This goes far more extreme. And it also forces people to think much harder. And usually autocrats don't like people to think very hard. And yeah, this, you know, we even see it. We, we, we were like, just be, uh, be, before we, we went online, we had this little issue with the gender, with the pronouns. Suddenly you have to think, wait a minute, how do I call him, her, they? And you have to stop and think. And that's really annoying. I mean, you know, I'm 44. I, I, I'm used to saying very clearly, I, I don't have to stop every few seconds and ask myself, wait a minute, how do I have to call them, him, her? But suddenly you have. And that's, uh, you know, this, the need to stop and think. Some people experience it all their lives that you know the people who say we never had to think about these things yes because uh you went along with the dominant story with the dominant narrative you know as a gay person i always had to think about what i'm saying so it's not really something new it's only something new to some people but really this forcing people to stop and think uh is annoying and they want to go back to the time when everything was, was simple and obvious. And, you know, you look at, at examples like, like, like what's happening in Hungary, and as a historian and as an, an academic, I feel a bit ashamed that um, Orban went after the gender studies departments, but not the history department. <laughs> that he closed down or forbade to teach gender studies in Hungarian universities, but not history, which means that maybe historians, you know, they, they are not a threat. So maybe they are not doing their, 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 their job so well if they are not frightening. So um, just a few of my thoughts on the matter. Um, let me add a little bit more to that, uh, because I also think that, <clears throat> you, you, uh, I mean, you pointed out this very, interesting thing that um, some people have always uh, had to think about it and suddenly you know we're asking a larger society to think about it but I think it's also that there's such a huge generational shift right I look at my kids and and my students who like swim in the sea of pronouns so easily right and they remember what everybody wants you know and um, this person wants to to shift between they and she all the time, and this person only uses they, and this person, you know, wants to, wants wants to use different pronouns in every other sentence, um, and this person changed their name yesterday, and everybody is now uh, using their name, um, and um, I think that this plays into, and it's uh, a very old trope, right, of those people with something different, those people who are fundamentally different from us. Are coming for our children. Right? So it's not just rapid social change, but a social change that's particularly noticeable among the kids. The kids have been snatched by those people, right? Um, and that's why it's so easy to weaponize, uh, because of course, you know, they're coming for your kids. It's, um, it's the most common anti, you know, most common homophobic trope but it's also, of course, the most common anti-Semitic trope. It's the most common anti-anything trope. And it really gets people at their deepest fears. And that's why it works. I'm conscious uh, of, our, of our time here. And this has, again, been an, an incredibly enriching 
discussion. And I, I want to squeeze in just two final uh, questions here, one for, for each of you from our, our Monk membership. And, and the first you of all goes to you. And maybe it can kind of orient us just at the end here a little bit possibly towards solutions. Um, mm. How do we address some of the issues that have been raised on this call? Um, this question comes from P.W. Smith. He's asking, you know, what should the role of government be in the 21st century? And maybe I just expand that slightly and say, what is the really the role of democracies? What is their responsibility? What can we practically do, Yuval, to avoid or at least at least de-risk possibly this kind of dystopian authoritarian future that uh, you and um, and Masha have been discussing today? Hmm. I think democracy certainly has a future. It's, it's the most adaptive system of government that people ever created. That, that's that's its, really its strength. And in this sense, it's almost always in crisis. But because it's able to rethink and reinvent itself, it can come out of this crisis uh, more easily and, and better. Again, to go back to history, you look at the 1960s and you compare the United States with the Soviet Union. So in the United States, you have all this social turmoil and riots and all these new movements and political assassinations and, and whatnot. And then you go to the Soviet Union, everything is quiet and orderly and uh, there is a consensus around everything. And you would think, well, it's obvious who is going to prevail. In 10, 20 years, this uh, a completely chaotic American system will collapse, whereas this very strong and consensual Soviet system, it will last who knows how long. And of course, 20 years later, it's the Soviet system that collapses. So I, I, I'm not too pessimistic about the, uh, about the future of democracy. There are dangers but it also has a lot of, of, of very deep strength in it. And we need it because you know, the key advantage of a democratic government, besides that you can, you can, you can change it, is, is if it adopts the wrong policy, it's easier for a democratic government to admit mistake and try something else. And again, if it doesn't do it, then the voters can ultimately replace it. Whereas a dictatorship has this tendency never to admit its mistakes. If they, if they adopt a wrong policy, they would always ac accuse somebody else that the problem is not because we adopted the wrong policy, it's because of the traitors from within, it's because of the enemies from without that are sabotaging our, our great nation. So the conclusion is we don't need to change our policy, we need more power to overcome these traitors and enemies. So instead of correcting it mis its mistakes, the system tends to amplify them. Um, but going to the broader question of, of the role of government, it has an, I mean, it, it, it's, it's indispensable. When you look at all the challenges we face, and, and we talked in, in this today mainly about the technological issues, so without government regulation, there is no way to, to deal with it. I mean, you can't rely on the corporations and on the engineers to regulate themselves. You can't rely on individuals. I mean, they, as an individual, I can try to protect myself, but there is a very, it's very limited what I can do as, a, as an individual. So we need governments to step in and do their job. And we saw it with the Corona crisis that uh, there is no replacement for public healthcare systems and for, for, for the government in this kind of crisis. And it's the same if we are afraid, uh, say, of the rise of uh, totalitarian surveillance systems, and they can come from the market or they can come from, 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 from uh, a political direction, then the, real, the only really effective way to stop it is with government regulation. But for that, you need, first of all, uh, to, to start the political discussion. Mm. Because, um, you know, I, I look at election campaigns in many countries around the world. In my own country, we have another election in, in, in less than two months, so the, the latest election in the US. And parties are hardly even talking about these issues. I mean, what's the difference between Democrats and Republicans? Mm. 
in their attitude to artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and how to regulate the immense power of algorithms. I don't know. You don't hear them talking about these issues. So you first Ultimately, to have the right government policy, you first of all need to make it a, a, a political question and to start the, the, the political debate. And um, I don't know if we'll succeed, but that's the only way forward. Again, if you are concerned about something, then my best recommendation would be, first of all, join an organization 50 people working together as part of an organization can accomplish far, far more than 500 individual isolated activists, each doing his or her own thing. And um, organizations should remember that ultimately it's about politics. That yeah, it's good to work on the cultural level and the social level and, and so forth, but ultimately it has to flow back to the political level and to shape government policy. Thanks, Yuval. Great uh, insights. I'm going to reflect on that answer for quite some time to come. Uh, Masha, final uh, question for you today to, to wrap up our discussion. It comes from Barbara Black. She's asking, considering your knowledge of Russian politics and considering the vis visibility of uh, Navalny's worldwide uh, media coverage of late, what potential is there for a future credible election in Russia involving either an alternate party with Navalny at the helm or Navalny's movement supporting an alternative uh, to the Putin regime. So again, let's try to push our minds a little bit into the future here and maybe get your thoughts, uh, Mosh, on how and if reform is possible in these systems. Do you, do, you, do you see them as inevitable or is there a chance for these systems to fracture under the the forces of a movement such as the one that Navalny has built? Um, so I'm going to do my favorite thing, which is to say that's the wrong question. Okay. Uh, Give us the right question. So, um, you know, the, the, because the, the, the assumption in that question is that um, fracture is possible and that, um, and, that it is, and that the regime can be responsive to outside pressure. I don't think... It, it is. At this point, it is a perfectly encapsulated thing. It's a black box um, in which things happen. It will collapse, you know, because every totalitarian regime, and at this point, I, I, would, I, I would classify the Putin regime as a totalitarian regime, uh, not, you know, a mass murdering totalitarian regime that um, of the early 20th century, but as we discussed, you know, as a, as a sort of economical uh, totalitarian regime, but certainly a regime that uh, rests on terror as one of its pillars, right? And on total control of the information sphere. A totalitarian regime is almost by definition impervious to outside pressure, outside forces, and its own people are outside of the totalitarian regime. But they will, it, it will collapse, you know, for some internal reason, whether it's because Putin dies or because Putin makes a mistake, it will collapse. We will not have elections in Russia until after the regime has collapsed. The regime is incapable of reform. It is incapable of fracture. It is capable only of the one, of, of sort of maintaining itself through greater and greater pressure in the, in the state that it's in or collapsing, which again, you know, eventually it will. So will uh, Navalny's movement then come in as, as, a, as a major political force? It depends on when it happens. If it happens in the next few years, which I think is relatively likely, um, then yes, absolutely. What Navalny is doing now is an investment in Russia's post-Putin future. But if Putin is lucky enough to continue hobbling along for another 10, 20, 30 years, who knows? You know, who knows what will still be able to grow on that scorched earth when he is gone? Thank you, um, Masha. And thank you, Yuval. This has been a, uh, just a fabulous discussion. And I, I really enjoyed this format of, uh, again, making myself obsolete and uh, allowing the two of you to lead the discussion. And Masha, I want to acknowledge your cat's occasional guest appearance in the program. That was uh, <laughs> that greatly was appreciated, too.
She looks like a lovely, uh, a lovely animal. Well, Monk members, that wraps up our conversation with Yuval Harari and Masha Gessen. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I'm going to have to experiment some more with this format of uh, two-way conversations. Uh, it really certainly elucidated a whole bunch of interesting perspectives and ideas. And thank you so much uh, for being part of the, the dialogue uh, and this program. I want to remind uh, all of our Monk members that uh, you can join our organization as a supporting member uh, for uh, a donation, a yearly donation. You get unlimited streaming of our 10 plus year online library, three supporter memberships for friends and family, a complimentary Monk debate book of your choice. We also have a new members only podcast out. All of that at monkdebates.com. Please consider being a supporting member and helping us stage discussions and dialogues like the one we enjoyed tonight. Also a reminder of all the great books uh, that uh, Masha and uh, Yuval have uh, in bookstores online right now, our partner Indigo. You can get the Sapiens, the new graphic novel version. It's uh, just recently released. Homo Deus, his, uh, his follow-up to Sapiens, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And then Masha's books, uh, The Future is History, a must-read, Surviving Autocracy, Today's latest book, and Man Without a Face, The Unlikely Rise of Vladimir Putin. Uh, all of those books available through our partner, Indigo. And just finally, to thank the Monk Foundation uh, for making all of these dialogues possible. This is what the Monk Debates is all about, civil and substantive conversation on the big issues of the day. Thank you for being part of this event. We'll have many more members-only programs and uh, gatherings together uh, in the weeks and months to come. We'll be emailing you about those. Thank you again for your support of our community, our efforts to restore the art of public discussion, one conversation at a time. Talk to you again soon.